Number one, it's about how we should press in through prayer. How we should press in through prayer. It actually speaks to the type of posture we should have. Or if you, another word that you could use is the attitude we should have when we pray. That when we come to the house of God, how many know when we pray, you know, we have the right to move in a particular attitude. That when we come in, you know, the Bible says that we can take hold of the horns of the altar. The second thing this story teaches us is not only how we should press in, but more importantly, who we're pressing into. Who we're pressing into. You know, how many know that we have a God in heaven? And how many know that we have a God that certainly hears our prayer and he has the ability to answer our prayer? Whenever God answers our prayer, he'll answer our prayer one of three ways, right? He'll say yes, he'll say no, or he'll say what? He'll say wait. So this story shows us not only how we should come, but who we're actually pressing into. See, this is important because many times Christians, I believe, have a tendency to lose faith in prayer. We have a tendency to lose faith in prayer. John the Baptist spent his days of preaching, ruling against the system. I think many Christians who are even in the house of God tonight, you, you spend your days and nights and your lives fighting the system, fighting the system of this world, fighting the system of your workplace, fighting all these different systems set up in the earth that many times when you're fighting these systems, these systems have a tendency to discourage you. How many can agree with that? So John the Baptist preached against the system. He, he began to uh, call those leaders to repentance. But then Jesus comes along and he points us, look at this, to a God that's bigger than the system. To a God that's bigger than the system. And many times there's Christians that we get discouraged, don't we? Throughout the year, we fight these battles and we feel like the system of this world is working against us. We struggle in our finances. We struggle in our health. We struggle in our jobs. We struggle in family situations. And you say, you know what? The system is getting the best of me. But you know what Jesus said? He said, there's a God on the throne that is bigger than the system that you could talk to every day. So what this scripture is teaching us here and what I want us all to hear is that prayer is not a waste of time. Prayer is not a waste of time. It's not a waste of your time to pray. Whether you pray tonight, you pray 15 minutes a day, whatever time you spend in prayer is not a waste of time as some may think. However, when you pray, Jesus does give us a command. How many knows that? He says, if you're going to pray, you need to pray in a spirit of faith. You must move in a spirit of faith. In Hebrews 11, 6, he says, anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. Look at this. And he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So look at the two words right there in prayer. Number one, believe. Can everybody say that together on the count of three? One, two, three. Believe. We need to believe. Have you lost your belief? Have you lost your spirit of faith when you pray? Do you believe that he exists? But then secondly, look at this. That he's a rewarder. Look at this. The word diligent. On the count of three, say that word. One, two, three. So what is the formula for successful prayer? Number one, to believe by faith. That when we get down on our knees or when we take that posture of prayer, that we believe that God is hearing those words that are coming out of our heart, coming out of our mouth. But then secondly, be diligent. Be diligent in your prayer. Don't give up. Seek him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. John 5, 16 says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Think about that. Look at the word effective. So what is faith? What is diligence? That's the third word. Effectiveness. That if you're moving in faith and you're praying in diligence, what are you doing? You're actually being effective in your prayer. And then the Bible says it avails much. It avails much. So how many know prayer is not a waste of time. I want us to get that down in our spirit. What are the things that you need God to do in your life before the end of this year? 
What are the things that you need God to do in your life before the end of this year? Do you need a miracle? Do you need family members to be saved? Do you need a breakthrough in your life? Maybe you want to see God do something powerful in your ministry. I, I don't know what it is that you need, but how many know it must first happen when the people of God get into a spirit of prayer? And how many know we're ready to pray? We're ready to pray. So this lesson teaches us that our prayers are important, but then it also teaches us that our prayers should be pointed and specific. Ian Bounds, the great author on prayer, says this story is the picture of a guest who continually knocks at the door until someone answers the door. And when we do not hear a response, we knock harder. We knock harder until God answers the door. But then how many know when God finally answers the door, we've got to be very specific about what we want. So tonight, when you get down into prayer, you need to be very specific. You, you need to knock. You need to knock hard. And then when he opens the door, be very specific about what you want. And then secondly, this lesson, this lesson always teaches us that we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't faint. Don't faint in prayer. See, if we are not answered immediately, we, we should not be discouraged. We should not be discouraged. If danger threatens us, we should not move. But we should stand our ground in prayer. Andrew Murray, another great author on prayer, said, True-hearted souls are frequently tried by divine delay in unanswered prayer and are tempted to give up the praying attitude. What, what happens? Why do some Christians slip away? Why do some leaders slip away? Why do some people slip away? I'll tell you why. Because they become discouraged in times of delay. They become discouraged in times of delay. They, they, they don't feel like their prayers are being answered. But how many know God allows delays sometimes? He allows delays sometimes because he wants to test the condition of a heart. I, I believe that if you're here tonight and you've been praying for something to happen and you're experiencing a delay, it's because God is building your character. And God is preparing you and God is getting you ready and God is putting you in a molding and a shaping process. Why? Because when God finally releases that answered prayer in your life, you're going to be ready to run with that promise that God has given you. So just lean over to your neighbor and tell him, faint not. Lean to your neighbor, other neighbor and tell him, don't give up. You know, three very simple things that we learn from this woman. Number one, never give up your prayer because there's too much at stake. Why, why should we pray? Why do we feel the Lord leading us as a church to pray? Because there's a lot at stake. There's a widow in that town who kept coming to him with this plea. Give me justice. Give me justice. Give me justice. So we pray because we recognize as a church that we have an investment. We have an investment. We, we, we have a lot at stake. Lives are important to God. How many can say amen? amen? And so if a lot's at stake, what should we pray for? What are some things that we can be sure God will answer when we pray? Well, I wrote a couple of things down. Number one, I, I think this is important. I think we should not only just pray for ourselves, but I think we need to pray for one another. Pray for one another. I think it's so important that we begin to look at our brothers and sisters in the church as our spiritual family. And to recognize that when, when people fall away from the Lord, it affects us. How many can say amen? It affects us. It, it brings discouragement within our life. And it's important to, to talk to people, and it's important to, you know, minister to people and do all those things. But, you know, one of the best things that you can do that's even more important than that is to pray for each other. Pray for each other. So I really believe that it's important that we should pray for each other because we live under a constant onslaught of, satan of satanic attack in our life. The enemy is constantly attacking people, attacking leaders, attacking new believers, and how many know that when the enemy attacks a leader, 
it could stop that person and or divert them to another path. Paul understood this and he actually coveted the prayers of the saints. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, he said, brethren, pray for us. Pray for us. Paul understood that he was not a superhuman Christian. And there is no such thing as a superhuman Christian, a superhuman pastor, a serpent, a superhuman leader. How many know each and every one of us needs the prayers of the people of God to make it? So we need to pray for each other. Then we need to also not only pray for each other, but we need to pray for the lost. That's our mission. Pray for the lost. Pray for our unsafe family members. You know, our, un our unsafe family members can resist our words. Can't they? They can argue. They could fight us on words and things like that. But how many know that? They're powerless against our prayers. Come on, they're powerless against our prayers. And how many know there's no distance either? They could be hundreds of miles away. And say, I'm never going to talk to you ever again. But how many know when you pray for them, something happens in the heavenly realms? And God is able to turn their hearts. Can I hear an amen? amen? So pray for the lost. And when you pray for the lost, be open to those opportunities that God will bring for you to minister to them. And then, and then thirdly, you know, I, I think it's important that we pray to remain effective in the things of God. I, I believe that every one of us, whether you're a pastor or you're a new believer, you know, we're not here just to come to church and just to, you know, Watch a show. You know. I mean, well, there's warfare involved. There's warfare involved, spiritual warfare. And we need to stay effective for God. We need to stay on the cutting edge. We need to stay preaching with power. We need to keep ministering with power. We need to move in the anointing of God. How many believe that God has called us to be effective in all we do? And then I'm going to close with this. Never give up when circumstances are working against you. It says, and there was a widow in that town who kept coming. And she said, give me justice. Grant me, you know, justice. And then she used this word against my adversary. Against my adversary. And, and how many know that for every step forward we take, there's an adversary. We have an adversary. You have an adversary. In fact, the very word Satan translated means adversary, right? That's the actual meaning of the word Satan. Everybody say adversary. adversary. You have an adversary. We all have an adversary. And this woman demonstrates to us, and Jesus uses this story to show us that when these circumstances rise up, the orchestrator is our adversary. In fact, Jesus said that he's called the father of all lies. You know, have you ever heard someone in the church say the devil is a liar? Huh? When we were in the gang years ago at the mother church, we used to tell some of the people, I said, you know what? You're a son, of, your, your, your father is the devil. The father of all lies. <laughs> we used to tell people that. All. We would tell people in the church that we messed with each other, you know. You're the son of the devil, the father of all lies. You know, you lie, you fry. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and, you know, we do have an adversary. We have an enemy. And what does he want to do? He just wants to stop you from praying. He wants to stop you from praying. He wants to stop you from being affected from the, for the Lord. And that's why you've got to have that persistence within your heart. I look at this story, and as they play softly, I just feel it's so appropriate that the star of this story is not a man, but it's a woman. You know? And I just find it so interesting that it's a woman that is the one that is going to the judge. In fact, when you look at the New Testament, a lot of times you see that it were the women in the Gospels that demonstrated that extra mile of faith. 
And I wonder if we have any women here tonight that you say, yes, pastor. Women know how to pray. Women know how to fight the good fight. Women know how not to give up when tough times rise. How many, how many ladies in here that say, yes, that's gospel truth. That You're preaching the truth. <laughs> and guys, I tell you, if you want to learn anything about prayer, watch your woman. Watch your woman. They pray loud. They know how to pray real loud. Father God, in the name of Jesus. And you know what really gets you guys is when they start praying loud and then they say, and I pray for my husband right now. And Lord, I pray for him right. And you're like, oh God, here we go. And I lift him up in prayer and I believe there's a calling on his life. And oh God, I know you've chosen him. I know you've anointed him. I know, I know you're doing a work. I know you've got a plan for him. Come on, ladies, help me know there's power in prayer when we are radical and relentless. And guys, can we be honest? When your woman's praying for you like that, doesn't it convict you a little? So, oh my God, I better get it together, man. I'm all messed up. But the Lord is showing us here how it works, how it could work in your life. And it's not just the women, but it's the men too. It's being persistent and it's committing your heart and saying, you know what? Situations might be working against me. The adversary might be working overtime in my life, overtime in my situation, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And you know what? I'm not going to let the enemy discourage my prayer life. No way. You know what? In fact, I'm going to crank it up another notch. In fact, I'm going to begin to pray. And I'm going to begin to fast even. And I'm going to put some meals aside. I'm going to push away from the table. And before this year is over, I'm going to walk out stronger than I walked in. I'm going to walk out more purposeful than I walked in. I'm going to walk out sharper than I walked in. I'm going to see some miracles released in my life. I'm going to see some breakthroughs in my children's life. Come on, who wants to, who believes we've got the formula, we've got the power to do it. I want you to lift your hands all over this place. And if you want to get that relentless spirit of prayer, I feel the Lord moving. Ladies, maybe you could lead the way. Show us. Get out of your seat right now. If you want to come to the altar, if you want to walk around, if you want to sit down. But I want us to, to lift up our voice. And I want us to begin to go before the judge of heaven and say, God, you're bigger than the system. You're bigger than the system, oh God. You're bigger than the situations that are trying to rise against me. Look at all these women coming. That's it, man. We need some sisters. We need some sisters. Come on, sisters. Show us how to do it. Come on, sisters. Show us how to do it, man. I, I respect women of prayer. I got a wife that prays. Presses in every single morning. Prays for me. Prays for our children one by one. Oh, come on, ladies. There's some room in the middle here. Brothers, can you join as well? Don't let's not spectate. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. Lord, we, we, we need justice. We need justice in our life. We need breakthrough in our life. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. We, 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 you're the only one that can move. You're the only one that can do it. I've tried everything. I've tried it all. And, and you're the only one, oh God. And I come to you because you're my father and I'm your child. And I have nowhere else to go. Lord, I have nowhere else to go. I have nowhere else to go. I have no one that can give me what I need. I have nobody, God. You're the only one that can give me my miracle. You're the only one, God, that can move that mountain, God. Where else can I run? Where else, God, can I go to? Oh, God, you're the only one that can heal me. You're my father, oh God. You're my, you're, the, you're my father. You're my, you're my heavenly father, Lord. You're, you're bigger than my trials. You're bigger than my situation. You're bigger, God, than my struggles. Nothing holds you back. Nothing hinders you, oh God. And 
and you said in due season I would reap if I did not lose heart so here I am God pressing in pressing in pressing in pressing in before the only one that could give me justice pressing in before the only one that could give me justice the only one that could meet my need we have some young people tonight and I want those young people to begin to pray for their parents some of you don't pray for your parents you don't pray for your mom and dad you don't pray for your grandparents that are providing a covering for you and I need some of the young people right now to start to pray for their parents your parents are under attack your parents are under attack your parents are being attacked by the enemy and you know why because the enemy wants you he wants to take control of your life and your parents are fighting for you and I want some young people to begin to rise up right now and start praying for your mom and dad start developing a compassion for them a, a greater compassion for your parents as they fight the good fight of faith oh i feel so broken tonight because there's we've got a reason to pray church we've got a reason to pray we've got a reason to go before the king tonight Oh God. 